It was 4.45 p.m. when the final bell mercifully rang out at Manhattan's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Hundreds of young immigrant workers tidied up their stations, anticipating a hard-earned weekend. In mere minutes, their American dreams would be engulfed in flames and wrenched from them forever. But anyway, tonight, oh my God, crazy story. And this is, you know what? I'm I'm bad at promoting my podcast, but got this podcast and I've been back and forth on the name about it, but, and we talked about that, but I guess we're going with what it is. And I got three episodes out now. Look at that. And they're me talking and Brienne said, I sound like the guy from Lore. <laughs> You know? I'm Aaron Mankey. Yeah, but I, uh, I I think I like it. I like the style of it, you know? Yeah, I think it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, so... That way uh, you can, you can like, put out... Your, you can crank out episodes without, you know, waiting for, yeah. for me to be, like, uh, you know, done with work or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, stuff. you guys may notice that I'm going to start putting out a lot of episodes, and I'm basically going to work myself to death because... Seems about right. This is, like, the only way I make money. <laughs> So I got to keep it going. You, you know? got to be able to c- continue to use your jury duty excuse. I do it. <laughs> yeah. Podcast. You got to at least keep it going for your for the next three years when you get called again. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I haven't like launched it, launched it yet. It's on all the all the apps, but it's called Disaster Thon. Let me just show you the I'm super happy about the logo. The dude that did the logo is really good. Tonight we are doing a crazy story. We're actually going to the Ash building, A S C H, which is still standing today in New York City. So let me uh let me go there right now on the Google Earth. I'm about to pull it up. And you know what this is by the title. Have you heard of this? I mean, the title's on there. No. No? Mm -mm. All right, here we go right here. Joanne, you requested this? Oh, yeah. So the reason I'm doing this story is because one of our good friends, Joanne, requested this. There you go. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. I was about to take credit for it, dude. Of course you were. <laughs> this does not surprise of me course, at all. It, it was on my list, but I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> this is the building right here. Now I say it is a historical landmark, but it was the scene of a tremendous disaster. So this is the building right here. And it says it's a historical landmark, but I'm pretty sure they still use it. Oh, this is... Uh, yeah, so this is it. It's on Green Street. Oh, shit. Oh, she studied fire science? What do you do? Do you mind me asking what you do? I don't think I've... We talked about your occupation. That's crazy. So I'm going to have to, like, bring my A game with this shit. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to correct you if you get anything wrong. And keep in mind, like, this isn't the main story this week, but I did my best. So I hope you do enjoy it. So tell me about the building, Joanne. Do people still use it? Is there, like, a museum there? Like, do you, Have you ever been there? A building can be a landmark and operational Colleen would like to clarify. Oh, okay. I did not know that. All right. Tonight we're going to March 25th, 1911. This is 440 PM. And I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the story, but tell me what is a shirt waist? Because this building is known as the Triangle Shirt Waist Factory. Now keep in mind, this is 1911. So what was going on then? Yada, yada. These were really popular at the turn of the century. Oh, I typed in shirt waist and the first thing that came up was the fire. Hmm. So, oh my God. So women used to wear these. <laughs> Look, oh my God. I can't believe y'all used to wear these. What do you mean y'all? It's like, <laughs> I wasn't there. Y'all should bring this back though, man. Yeah. You, you're digging the look. Yeah, I kind of am. So this is shirt waist. So can you describe what this is? According to Triangle, the fire that changed America by David Von Drell, the shirt waist took its name from its resemblance to a man's dress shirt. It featured front buttons, stiff detachable collars and long sleeves finished with tight buttoned cuffs. For anyone wearing one, the effect was tall, elegant and graceful. All right. So the Ash Building, this is March 25th, 1911. We're talking about the whole building, but more specifically, 
the three top floors, floor seven, eight, and nine, is the floors that produce the shirt waste. And at the time, they had about 500 employees. And it was monotonous work. It is grueling, monotonous work. Sewing, I mean, because this is during the the fabric revolution, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they had the big sewing machines and stuff like that, but they'd still have to do a lot of it by hand. Like all the buttons on the thing, they'd have to put all the buttons in. So you have 500 people on these three floors that are monotonously putting these shirts together all day. And we're talking, 12 hour days. This, some, is, this is before like Fair Labor Standards Act and yes. things like that. In fact, this story that we're going to talk about tonight changed a lot of things mm. about the workplace that we still see today. And you know, it's crazy because I don't, uh, I may be wrong, but I don't think this story is hugely popular for how devastating it was, but it did change a lot of things that we see. Mm -hmm. At the time, it employed 500 workers. What kind, what type of workers would be in this building doing this all day in 1911? Like who would pick up this type of work? Children? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't. Isn't this before no. before that time? Uh, I I don't think that was a time in America, was it? Yeah, of course it was. We had child labor. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. It could have been, have been immigrants. Shit, we need to bring that back. No, stop. Mostly immigrants. Okay. Long hours, low wages. This is what Marx talks about: the capitalism, the exploitation, the for profit, all that stuff. It is basically they're demanding these workers to just slave all day for hardly no money. And they're they're pretty much stuck because they're immigrants. They immigrate here for what? To find prosperity for themselves and their family. Mm -hmm. But then they end up in this factory 12 hours a day or more putting button after button after button after button and sewing, 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 you know, all freaking day. Yeah. It gets pretty grueling. I mean, it's got to. Not only that, you got to remember Remember, this is all cotton pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that's really flammable. Plus all the other fabrics they have. True. And they didn't have the safety standards they had today, like they have today with protecting fabric against fires right, and right, stuff right. like that. Because uh, I think in cer like certain p articles of clothing have to be flame retardant. They, ch right, like children's pajamas. I think we talked about that in one episode all before. I know pilot's underwear has to be flame retardant. Interesting. As you read earlier, according to the book, Trying, Mm -hmm. the fire that changed America. This is a fire we're talking about. Right. This is a devastating fire that ended up killing 146 people in less than 30 minutes. We're talking about 22 to 23 minutes and 146 people end up dead. Wow. And it's not the fire that killed them. It killed some of them, huh. but the majority of them died by other ways, which we're going to talk about. They're like, okay. th there are three big ways that I found that the fire... That that this event killed 146 people. The victims of the Triangle Inferno were some of New York's most vulnerable. The casualty list is a reflection of inequality and the imbalance of power. There's a fire that ignites on the eighth floor. Now, like I said, we're talking about three floors, the very top of the building. The eighth floor, a fire ignites. And this isn't the first time it's happened. We're going to go over another occasion where this actually happened just a year before. No one was... In injured and they were supposed to bring in some new regulations with this fire that happened a year ago, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. So a fire breaks out. We do not know the exact cause, but I will say the immigrants that were there, the 500 immigrants, and we're talking about it, uh, Italians, Jewish immigrants, they, a lot of them smoke, smoke cigarettes. Right. That's like the only thing to do if you're just sitting there sewing buttons and buttons and buttons, mm -hmm. you light up a cigarette. Well, that fabric, as we talked about, is super flammable. So Ooh. if you like, I don't know, accidentally flick your cigarette or a little bit of the ash comes off, it could ignite that. And, and no one's ever going to know what the, the start of the fire was. But there was one report that it may have been a disgruntled employee. But that was kind of mm. maybe more rumor than anything. Yeah, that was more rumor. Got it. I, those those types of uh, conspiracies pop up when you see like, you know, something like, something that. like yeah, this. That yeah, that makes sense. I get that. According to the American Experience PBS series on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. 
Although the official report was inconclusive, most experts agree that the likely cause was a lit cigarette or match accidentally dropped into a bin of scraps and rags somewhere on the eighth floor. We're talking about 20 minutes. Within 20 minutes, the fire goes from the eighth floor and kills 146 people on three different floors. It spread through the eighth floor so fast because it was fueled by these fabrics and these clothes and the dye that was used. The workers, they see the smoke. They start to panic immediately. And then they see the flames coming up through their floor. It is engulfing the entire top of this building. The flames are just engulfing it Mm -hmm. like it's nothing. All this fabric is just fuel for it. So the workers, what do they do? Well, they they fight to escape. What else is there to do? What do you do? Like, what would you do? You'd run towards the fire exit, right? Right. That's the first thing you do. That's and what so they're there. Else is run into that too. Is well, the fire exits. They were there at the time for this reason, which mm-hmm. is good. However. Can you read what one survivor said when she tried to go to the fire escape? Mm -hmm. Hey, Wolfie. What's up, Wolfie? Uh, Kate Leon, a bookkeeper at the company who survived the fire, later testified, quote, I rushed to the door. It was locked. I rushed to the next door. It, too, was locked. Just imagine for a moment, feeling the intense heat of the fire, the smoke blackening your vision and burning your lungs. You rush to the near ex- nearest exit, a fire escape, perhaps, and you find it locked as if fate was taunting you. <laughs> Shram says, I'm blissfully listening to this at work, dead center of a brick warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, hopefully the doors are not locked. This gets pretty bad pretty oh, quick. God. It's not just fire here. And uh, Martin says, every man for himself, which is true at that point. Yep. But no one thought it was going to be, I mean, all right, 500 people and 146 of them are dead. That's nearly almost half. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's under half. It was like 40%. 40% of the work population is dead, right? That's my math is yeah. not great, but it's Jesus. Kate Leon continues. Quote, I stood there hypnotized for a moment and then I rushed to the windows. As I looked up, they began jumping from the ninth floor. I jumped back into the room. We're talking about less than 30 minutes. There was one elevator. Okay, let's rush to the elevator. Everyone just rushes to the elevator. As the flames are erupting on the eighth floor, on the ninth floor, the elevator, everyone rushes to that one elevator and the elevator quickly exceeds its maximum maximum capacity of 15 people inside. There are 30 to 40 people in this elevator. So this has nothing to do with the fire, nothing to Mm do. But the cables, the pulleys, they start to strain. They're overloaded. They're overloaded. They're overworked. There's too many people. It can't hold that much weight before they can even press the button to go all the way down. Those cables snap, just like you see in the movies where the elevator falls. This elevator fell from the ninth floor and it was going so fast it plunged down an empty shaft huge thud blood curdling screams reported by witnesses everyone in this elevator dead you could hear them screaming as they're falling down this has nothing to do with the fire i mean it does because that's why they piled in the elevator but the elevator broke because of too many people just another just f you with this story all the writers in this elevator were killed instantly upon brutal impact that is like a a, getting stuck in an elevator total fear can you imagine that extreme of christ i mean that that gives me such a pit in my stomach of just terrifying. I think there's a couple like really horrific things. I think dying by fire and dying by drowning yeah. would, are just like, oh my gosh, just horrific ways um, no shit. To, to pass away. In the episode, I said something. I wrote something like, like you could hear the blood curdling screams from inside the elevator as it plummets to the basement. And the only reprieve from that is when it hits the basement floor, the loud sound the thud boom and it's it's like a breath of fresh air because you can't hear the screaming anymore but you know they're all dead inside isn't that crazy i don't know according to one factory foreman max roth talking about the elevators this is what he said 
The cables gave way and the loaded car fell down again, level after level, slowly crushing and mangling those inside until it landed in the dark pit at the bottom. I could hear bending iron and steel, but worse, even than I could hear the cries of the dying people as they went down into eternity. Everyone that was in that elevator was dead. Wow. Everyone. Maximum capacity, 15 people. Jesus. I think I saw the number was like 43 people were in that elevator. Colleen makes a really good point. Everything was flammable back then. Insulation was straw. Newspaper was used under plaster, under a lot of construction materials, actually. I mean, the whole thing is like poof. The workers that didn't go for the elevator went towards the fire escape and the fire, I'm talking about the the one fire escape that had the door actually open. Kate runs to the fire escape, door after door after door, locked. Why? They're, they're fire That makes escapes. no sense, yeah. Well, the factory owners, which were two guys, which we'll talk about, they locked all the factory doors to prevent break-ins and people taking actual too long breaks. Like they'll go out there and smoke or whatever. So they locked all of the fire doors. Now, the one that was open with the with the stairs that go down was also overpopulated and crowded because you have another hundred something people trying to go down this, this fire escape. So as people started running out of this one, knowing that there's a fire escape, that actually collapses as well. So there are people that run out of the fire escape door thinking they're going to be running down the stairs and they run straight out of the building and fall to their death because that fire escape is no longer there because it has collapsed and they had no idea. Oh my God. Many workers were trapped in this. This is on the the Green Street side where I showed you on the Google Earth. I said, that's Green Street. It was basically, I guess, the side facing all the other buildings. That thing collapses. It was a narrow structure that consisted of one iron ladder that attached to the exterior of the building. Already overwhelmed with victims trying to descend by 4.45 p.m., bolts and the structure gave way under the excessive weight and movement. Twisted metal sent victims plunging roughly 100 feet to the street below. I mean, this is wild. At least horrific. At, at least 50 people died specifically from the fire escape. Oh my God. The ones that fell from it initially and the <sighs> ones that ran out the fire escape door thinking there was that ladder there. And because there's what, what's behind you is this freaking inferno. So the first thing you do is run out and you're not like you looking think you're, down. Right. You think you're about to land yeah. on safety and then you look down to, to get a exactly. stairs or ladder or whatever. I mean, because you're, you're running at full speed. You're not thinking. The inferno, the flames are right behind you. So you open that door and just jump out expecting to stand on this platform that goes down the stairs to an iron ladder and that platform's not there. But guess what? You've already exited the building. So there's a hundred... And uh, such a commotion that yeah. it's not like one person does it and everybody behind stops. Everybody's just jumping. Exactly. So we're already at almost 100 people, 40 something from the elevator, another 50 likely due to the fire escape alone. This is from one survivor, a Rose Glantz. This is her account. Can you read it? We watched the bodies come hurtling down. Every few seconds, a girl came plunging wildly down, arms and legs flailing and flying, striking the railing, bouncing off, bumping up other girls as finally they landed on the pavement. Finally, they landed on the pavement. Jesus. Yeah. Literally two escape exits gave way. (laughs) What the fuck? I guess the only thing to do now is go down the real stairs. You know, let's see how that works. They had one door you got to pull open. Pull. So you have a hundred or so people, the rest of the workers, well, more than that, you have 300 people, that the ones that aren't dead already, trying to get out of this door that opens inward inside the building. So what does that do? Have you ever seen that those Black Friday things at like Walmart where people just stand there and mm-hmm. it's just a freaking stampede? Yes. Mm-hmm. You 
you have 300 I mean, bodies. No, but I know what you're talking about. You I would have, never do that. <laughs> you have 300 bodies clogged in these doors and the doors opened inward. So it was it was hard to even get those open. Right. I mean, just the door direction screwed yeah. up big time, you know? Yeah, no shit. Doors became jammed from weight of panic crowds pushing, victims scrambling over each other, trying to desperately find an exit. Firefighters outside trying to break the locks, but they were too late. Jesus. This is giving me so, so much anxiety just listening to it, you know? Can you read from one witness, Joseph Fletcher? The girls were packed together like sheep in a cattle car. They continued to struggle until smoke and flames ended their cries. Oh, Jesus my God. Christ. Oh, man. I mean, this is a pile up, a pile yeah, a up, person pile up, a pile up of people getting smoked out to death. Jeez. If you did make it outside, if you were one of the 60 percent that lived, there was a new horror outside. Can you read what one onlooker, William Shepard, said about outside the building? I learned a new sound that day. The thud of a speeding body on a stone sidewalk, Jeez. said onlooker William Shepard. Scores of women jumped from all three floors over 100 feet to the hard pavement rather than face the flames. It was a freezing cold day, noted a New York Times reporter recording the tragedies in 1911. The onlookers were mostly women and they could not stand the horror and fled from the site. They were lifted as though by mighty hands and hurled to the death because inside it was impossible to get down the stairs. Isn't that crazy? Those inward doors caused too much of a pile up. They yeah. couldn't even get to the damn stairs. Jesus. So now they're hurling. It says this guy, the New York Times reporter says they were lifted as though by mighty hands and hurled to death. They're jumping. They're okay. jumping if off because I they don't <laughs> feel anxious right now. Jesus Christ. Like my stomach is clenching. I am. I am just anxious hearing about this. Onlookers watch in shock and terror. I would imagine. Imagine kind of like the 9-11, you know, you remember the jumper, that one famous jumper, mm -hmm. the, you know, what the photo, do you, have you seen the photo of the jumper? That's what it's called, the jumper. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yes. one where he's like yes. head first going down. Yes. So, I mean, imagine that. Jesus Christ. Not quite the same heights, but. Yeah. Onlookers, they're watching these bodies hit the pavement. He says, I learned a new sound that day, the thud of a speeding body on a stone sidewalk. Oof. Jesus Christ. That is and that is a, a bad disaster. This was the worst industrial disaster in New York City history. 146 workers died wow. on this one. So I told you there was a previous fire of this. There was a previous fire in this factory. On November 1st, 1910, a fire broke out. The fire was first noticed on the building's top eighth floor around the same time. So it's the same, the same floor as the fire that started a year later. It was even described by newspapers as, quote, comparatively small. The main impact was destroyed shirt waste, you know, the product, and property damage. But it was a fire that made the newspaper. So they had a chance. Honestly, if it would have killed two or three people, or maybe even one, we wouldn't probably even be talking about the story because they would have done things like they do now, regulations, fire regulations, not locking the safety exits and stuff like that, elevator capacity limits, you know, structural things to, to so, you know, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But then again, they are immigrants. So, you know, the officials and the fact owners pretty much ignored that fire of 1910 and nothing, nothing was done. It was like a forewarning from God. Literally, you know, this is it. This is your warning. Uh, not even a year later, 146 people dead. So let's talk about the, that, the aftermath here, I guess. The two factory owners did escape. They were on the very top floor. They actually get up on the roof and jump to another building and they make it to safety. They were brought to court on manslaughter charges, but it was dismissed. And that was very, wow. it was really controversial, that case, from what I was reading. I bet. Because they basically got in no trouble whatsoever for it. I, do you think that would happen today? If uh, I think if, if that same situation happened today, I think they would have uh, been convicted. Of what? Manslaughter. Yeah, but they wouldn't, I mean, how they wouldn't spend life in prison. Mm, 
I could I could see 20 years for something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's involuntary maybe, but that's a lot of that's a lot of lives. Well, so we've done stories before around this time that we see a lot of hatred for the immigrants, you know. So, I mean, these were all immigrants, all all Italian, Irish, Jewish. Mm-hmm. They were all immigrants that worked here. That does impact it some. I mean, if they were all it's like... sign of the times, for if they sure. Were, if they were all like 16-year-old white girls, then it'd be different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, you're... <laughs> You're not wrong. Like, that's that's the sad truth. There was a mass mourning and funerals for all the victims. Over 100,000 people mourned in the city for, for this fire. There have been anniversaries. I've seen anniversaries every, like, 20 years. I haven't seen one lately. The last one I've seen was 1990. Wow. So 23 years ago, uh, 33 years ago. So I, I feel like it's kind of... Being I forgotten. Hadn't heard of it. Yeah. I, yeah. I hadn't heard. Well, so you can thank this fire for sprinklers, you know, the sprinklers in every building, oh, okay. emergency exits, and fire escape drills, and probably a lot more things too. That's just what I've seen. What do you think? Uh, I mean, that is terrifying, shocking. I'm I'm pretty blown away that no charges stuck at all. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. But that was a little short story there. I want to start doing these little short ones. That is so crazy. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back tomorrow, headlines. And then I'll have another story this week. And then I guess Jen will be here. Thanks for being here. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people. I kind of run this shit. It was 4.45 p.m. when the final bell mercifully rang out at Manhattan's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Hundreds of young immigrant workers tidied up their stations, anticipating a hard-earned weekend. In mere minutes, their American dreams would be engulfed in flames and wrenched from them forever. Buckle up and brace for impact. You're listening to Disasterthon, where catastrophe is always on the schedule. Today we dive into the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1911. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory produced ladies' blouses, known as shirtwaists, which were very popular at the turn of the 20th century. According to Triangle, The Fire That Changed America by David Von Drell, the shirtwaist took its name from its resemblance to a man's dress shirt. It featured button fronts, stiff detachable collars, and long sleeves finished with tight buttoned cuffs. For anyone wearing one, the effect was tall, elegant and graceful. The factory itself employed around 500 workers, mostly young immigrant women in their late teens and early 20s from Italy, Eastern Europe, and Russia's Jewish enclaves who had recently embarked on lives in America, hoping to earn steady wages to support themselves and sometimes their families back home. They worked long days, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. during the week, plus half days on Saturdays. The monotonous job of sewing ladies' blouses on industrial machines in cramped loft space for only around $7 to $15 per week. It was grueling labor under pressure of supervisors demanding maximum output. Historians underscore that this tragedy sprang as much from the merciless economic forces exploiting an immigrant underclass as from the convergence of hazardous workplace conditions and neglect of safety precautions. The victims of the Triangle Inferno were some of New York's most vulnerable. The casualty list, a reflection of inequality and the imbalance of power. The exact cause of the fire remains unknown, though historians and investigators point to several likely possibilities. Although the official report was inconclusive, most experts agree that the likely cause was a lit cigarette or match, 
accidentally dropped into a bin of scraps and rags somewhere on the eighth floor. There had reportedly been another smaller fire at the factory just one year earlier in 1910 that had alerted many to the dangers of fire hazards and lack of precautions. It was common for workers to smoke at their machines as a way to make the grueling days a bit more bearable, with matches and cigarettes casually carried in pockets or tossed into scrap piles. Furthermore, the State Bureau of Labor and Safety Investigation also raised the possibility of faulty electric wiring sparking flames that then swiftly spread between all the fabric scraps and clothes material scattered about. Or, that the fire could have been started intentionally by a recently laid off angry employee, though that was largely dismissed as unlikely. With so many flammable materials, like cotton shirt waists and bits of fabric strewn about, a cramped space lacking sprinklers and where smoking regularly occurred, it unfortunately did not take much to spark a horrific tragedy once those initial flames erupted and began consuming everything in their path on March 25, 1911. As the flames began to swallow its surroundings, panicked seamstresses rushed toward the exits only to find the doors locked, a common practice used by supervisors to minimize break-ins and thefts. Kate Leon, a bookkeeper at the company who survived the fire, later testified, I rushed to the door. It was locked. I rushed to the next door. It too was locked. Just imagine for a moment, feeling the intense heat of the fire, the smoke blackening your vision and burning your lungs. You rush to the nearest exit, a fire escape perhaps, and you find it locked as if fate was taunting you. Kate Leone continues, I stood there hypnotized for a moment and then I rushed to the windows. As I looked up, they began jumping from the ninth floor. I jumped back into the room with smoke quickly filling up floors and visibility fading. Women desperately smashed windows seeking air to breathe. The window panes cracked, Fanny Lansner, a pattern maker recalled. The loosened window sashes permitted some ventilation, which kept alive the last few minutes of struggling for locked in workers. Triangle employee Morris Paulson described the scene. I could see girls were throwing themselves from the window. The other girls were all crowded around the windows. Just about this time, the platform was crushed in with people jumping on it. Those who made it to the interior open elevator soon found themselves in a frightening spot. The elevator that was supposed to carry them to safety, but instead, it plunged from the ninth floor into the basement, killing everyone inside. The harrowing loud thud after the detached carriage plummeted to the earth was a welcome reprieve to the prior screams from those inside. To make matters worse, many who did manage to reach the ground floor safely surged toward a door on Washington Place that opened inward, making their exit impossible against the crush of bodies trying to flee. Emergency responders tried breaking open the door from the outside, but it was too late for most. For the few lucky workers who did escape the walls of fire found a new horror waiting for them outside. I learned a new sound that day, the thud of a speeding body on a stone sidewalk, said onlooker William Shepard. Scores of women jumped from all three floors over 100 feet to the hard pavement below rather than face the flames. It was a freezing cold day, noted a New York Times reporter recording the tragedies in 1911. The onlookers were mostly women, and they could not stand the horror and fled from the site. They were lifted as though by mighty hands and hurled to death, because inside it was impossible to get down the stairs. Though it inflicted tremendous damage, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire itself lasted less than 30 minutes. In less than a half hour, 146 lives were lost, and a pivotal shift begun in labor laws and perceptions of industrial working conditions. 
due to highly flammable cloth materials throughout the factory floors, open windows dispersing air currents, lack of fire breaks or automatic sprinklers, and locked doors obstructing exit routes, the blaze tore through the top three levels with immense speed and intensity. By 4.45 p.m., it had already spread from the 8th to 9th and 10th floors as panicked workers rushed to escape. And by 5 p.m., with rescue crews on scene, the worst was over as the last flames flickered out, leaving mainly just wreckage and smoke behind. In the immediate aftermath, the city responded with shock, mourning, and demands for accountability. Large public funerals were held and attended by over 100,000 grieving community members. Labor groups and progressive activists marched for reform and justice. Investigations were launched into the factory conditions that hastened such disaster. And the victims came to symbolize the dangerous exploitation of immigrants and the working class in unsafe environments lacking adequate protections. The factory owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, had managed to survive the fire after fleeing to the roof when it began and climbing to a neighboring building. They were indicted on first and second degree manslaughter charges for locking the exit doors, though they were later acquitted in a controversial trial. While some viewed it as a failure of the justice system, the fire at least brought widespread public awareness to the unsafe working conditions and helped catalyze major improvements in regulations around factory safety requirements, mandatory fire drills, dedicated exits and escape routes in tall buildings, and ultimately, the growth of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Over a century later, the victim's sacrifice reminds us of the often preventable perils faced by marginalized immigrant and working classes. By bearing witness to the terrified final moments of those seamstresses, jumpers, and fire victims, we uphold a duty to demand that no one enduring harsh labor conditions face such needless calamity again. We've made it to the end of another treacherous trek through tragedy. Join us next time on Disasterthon, where we'll face even more havoc head on.